five miles above the moon, Dave Scott and Jim Irwin looked out the window of their lunar module down toward Al Warden in the command module, which had completed its separation maneuver. Beneath them, the 15,000-foot peak of the lunar Apennine Mountains. Soon they would fly low over those peaks on their way to a landing in a little valley in the mountains of the moon. Over. 64. Okay. Bam, LPD. LPD. Coming right. Out their window, they could see Four the sinuous three. meanderings of the lunar LPD. canyon LPD. known as Hadley okay. Rill as they brought their lunar module, called Sign Falcon, toward its landing. And the beginning of what would be one of the most significant chapters in the history of scientific exploration. 9% Scott and Irwin were located on an undulating plain situated between the Apennines and Hadley Rill, an area selected by the scientists as being one of the most geologically significant sites on the moon. Okay, over here at Hatch, open a ledge. Two hours after touchdown, Dave Scott stood up in Falcon's upper hatch to survey their landing area. Oh boy, what a view. Uh, I can see Pluton uh, and Icarus. As Scott stood describing the craters and mountains, we on Earth perhaps did not yet realize the scope and extent of the coming mission. Aboard the lunar module was a small dune buggy-like car called the Lunar Roving Vehicle, or just plain Rover. The astronauts would travel miles in collecting samples and placing and conducting experiments. Uh, there are no sharp, jagged peaks. There are no large boulders apparent anywhere. They would observe the layering of the lunar terrain most clearly seen in the formation 14 miles to the south, called Silver Spur. This layering, later to be observed in the mountains and the rill, gives scientists a direct look at the structure of the moon and a deeper insight as to the significance of the collected samples. The journey of Apollo 15 had begun four days earlier, July 26, 1971. The crew, Dave Scott, spacecraft commander and veteran of Gemini 8 and Apollo 9. Jim Irwin, lunar module pilot, who would explore Hadley Rill and the Apennine Front with Scott. Al Warden, command module pilot, who would remain in lunar orbit operating an extensive array of cameras and experiments and making observations which, when coupled with the surface work of Scott and Irwin, would give the most comprehensive picture of the moon's structure and history ever achieved. We have complete clearance to launch. We are go. 15 seconds. Guidance internal. 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8. Ignition sequence start. Engines on. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Launch and running. Launch connect. Liftoff. We have liftoff at 9.34 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. The tower is clear. And we have a roll program. Thank you. 
precisely on schedule, 9.34 a.m., Apollo 15 lifted from the pad on its way to the moon. And we have a pitch program. Right with the exception of a few minor problems, the trip out would be uneventful. The command module Endeavour, carrying the lunar module Falcon, would arrive in lunar orbit with Scott's announcement. Hello, Houston. The Endeavour is on station with cargo, and what a fantastic sight. Oh, this is really profound. I'll tell you, this is absolutely mind-boggling up here. Gentlemen, I can well imagine that a foreign planet must be a weird thing to see. July 31st, after a night's rest, Dave Scott descended into the lunar morning. Okay, Houston, as I stand out here in the wonders of the unknown at Hadley, I try to realize there's a fundamental truth to our nature. Man must explore. And this is exploration at, at its greatest. Scott was then joined by Jim Irwin. Oh boy, it's beautiful out here. Reminds me of Sun Valley. Their first job was to get the lunar roving vehicle out of its storage bay. Looks like she's coming down okay. Jim, up, up. That looks good. Boy, is this dirt soft. Like soft powder snow. Next, the astronauts tried out the rover. During this test drive, one failure showed up. The rover was designed to steer through both its front and rear wheels. steering, Joe. Like just rear steering, Dave. Yeah. In use, the absence of front wheel steering would hardly be noticed. Then they loaded the equipment they would need for their geological survey and boarded the rover for their first exploration. Okay, we're moving forward, Joe. Roger. They were headed toward St. George Crater, located on a mountain slope above Hadley Rill to the south of the landing site. Ooh, hang on. Man, this is really a rock and roll ride, isn't it? There would be a stop to collect samples at a smaller crater called Elbow, then arrival at the base of St. George and a look into Hadley Rim. Oh, look at that. Oh, look back there, Jim. Look at that. That's yeah, beautiful. That is spectacular. This is unreal. The most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Scott then adjusted the television antenna on the rover. A quarter of a million miles away, in Houston's mission control, a flight controller operated the television camera mounted on the rover. Scientists and engineers on Earth could directly monitor the lunar exploration. And those of us at home watching on television felt like the third astronaut on the moon. That looks fairly reasonable, doesn't it? It sure does. Okay, now we got the fillet, we got the soil, now we need to sample the rock. Yeah. The astronauts began to select samples and photograph the area. The samples would consist of rocks picked up with a rake-like device, soil samples, Selected rocks and chips taken from boulders. Can you imagine that, Joe? Here sits this rock, and it's been here since before creatures roamed the sea on our little earth. They would also drive core tubes into the lunar soil to collect contiguous specimens from beneath the surface. But now it was time to return to the lunar module. Not to end this first work period on the lunar surface, but to begin another phase. I can't believe. Uh, we came over those mountains. <laughs> we did. It's just a beautiful little valley. Yeah, those are pretty big mountains to fly over, aren't they?
After returning to the LEM to load equipment, they moved to a nearby location to set up a science station similar to those left on previous missions. With the establishment of these experiments, a network of scientific stations was achieved which would allow triangulation of events and give us the ability to locate precisely the origin of lunar events. As they worked, one of their instructions was to throw the packing as far as possible from the site. Dave Scott. I'll give you a demonstration here, Joe. Roger, right on here, Joe. Spectacular demonstration. Oh, well, enough of that. Lovely. What was that a demonstration of, by the way? It started out to be of gravity, and it uh, wound up being of uh, centrifugal force, I think. Using an electric drill, Scott sank a tube into the lunar soil into which a probe would be placed to measure heat flow in the lunar material. The difficulty in drilling would delay placement of the second probe until the next day. The science station was then activated and Scott and Irwin closed Falcon's hatch on EVA number one. miles above the moon, Al Warden orbited in the command module Endeavour. Operating experiment, his observations adding to the wealth of scientific data already accumulated. Okay, I'm looking right down on Litro now at a very interesting thing. It looks like a whole field of uh, small cinder cones down here. The detection of cinder cones, clearly of volcanic origin, helped solve another element of the controversy about how much of the moon was formed by volcanoes, and how much by meteoroid impact. Warden was operating a series of experiments in the scientific instrument module. These included a mapping camera to shoot lunar features and simultaneously the star field for accurate location of these features, a panoramic camera, a laser altimeter for accurate topographical mapping, and a series of experiments to analyze the chemical makeup of the lunar crust. In the estimation of a number of scientists, this orbital research station would provide the most important information collected during the mission. Okay, down the ladder to the plains of Hadley. August 1st, Scott and Irwin prepared for their second day on the moon. And as Scott checked the inoperative forward steering of the rover, You know what I bet you did last night, Joe? You let some of those Marshall guys come up here and fix it, didn't you? It worked, Dave? Yes, sir. It's working, my friend. Beautiful. Their destination was the base of the Apennine Front. Here they hoped to find some of the basic substance of the lunar highlands. Well, as we drive uh, up sun here, I like to see uh, Mount Hadley and the linear patterns in it are really remarkable. Then they began the physical sampling of the Apennine Front stopping at four craters in their traverse. Oh, boy. It's a nice little crater in it. It sure is. Okay, Jimmy, let's go to work. Roger. Look at that. Uh, Almost see twinning in there. Guess what we just found? I think we found what we came for. Crystal rock, huh? Yes, sir. You better believe it. To the untrained eye, it looked like just another rock but its large crystals, formed in pairs called twinning, showed it to be a section of primal lunar crust, formed during the earliest history of the solar system, not obliterated by billions of years of impact and lava flows. It was a key to many mysteries. Was the early lunar crust molten? Why differences in color and density between the highlands and lowlands? Nicknamed the Genesis Rock, it stands as a major clue in unraveling the formative processes of the moon, the earth, and the planet. Let's make this bag number 196 a special bag. Yes, sir. Joe, this crater is a gold mine. And there might be diamonds in the next one. Yeah, babe. 
Then we saw another practical use of television in lunar exploration. And Dave, uh, you're going to want to cinch up Jim's collection bag probably before you go much longer. It's coming uh, very loose there. Okay. It's coming, uh, very loose. Let me do it right now, Joe, Just don't, so we don't forget it. Roger, we sure don't want to lose that one. Up. I don't know what we do without you, Joe. Okay, Jim, let's get on a rover and get back. Okay, I'm it's nice to sit down, isn't it? Oh, it is. Okay, we're on our tracks. Roger. And follow them home. There's sure a lot of neat rocks in uh, Dune. Too bad we can't spend some more time. On your next trip. Yeah, next trip, you're right. They're going to be seasick. <laughs> what do you expect uh, traveling on the Mari? They returned to the science station where Scott once more manned the drill to place the second heat flow probe and later to get a deep core sample. The difficulty in drilling was shown by Scott's hand, which would carry bruised fingernails from his efforts for several weeks after the mission. Okay, Dave, take heart. You've got just one minute of drilling left. Okay, we made a little money, didn't we? And over fifth. It was time to get back into the LEM and end EVA-2. The drill and attached sections were left in the ground for removal during the next day's traverse. On Earth, scientists poured over data from the television, from the astronauts' descriptions, and from the orbiting experiments. The 1,400 photographs the crew would return would themselves constitute a major scientific legacy. Lunar exploration was achieving a new maturity. We are now exploring to test new hypotheses, and the pieces were fitting together. One scientist, when asked why he didn't sit down and rest after an around-the-clock session, replied, I can't. I'm too excited. Well, it's nice to be outside where you can stretch a little bit. Okay. Into the sight. Yeah, I'll meet you up there. After the drill, we last left our friend. Oh, it's our friend, huh? Yes, it is. Uh, if we could just get our shoulder under that. Okay. Their first stop was at the drill they had left during the second EVA. This core tube was the deepest sample ever collected from the moon. Perhaps the deepest we would ever get. Eight and a half feet beneath the surface, cutting through 58 distinct layers. This would not only tell us more about the lunar structure, but contained in this soil were traces of particles emitted by the sun billions of years ago, which would give us a clue to the early years of the solar system. But now it was time to leave the core tube, to be picked up later, and head west-northwest to the rim of Hadley Rill. Then Scott and Irwin descended a short distance over the rim of Hadley Rill to get a piece of one of the large blocks thought to be lunar bedrock. A big rock there. Sure is. Let's go down and get a chunk of the bedrock here. Get a little closer so you get that big chip out of there. Boy, what a rock. Get ready to move out, Dave. They buckled their seat belts for the ride back to the lunar module. Oh, what a big mountain that Hadley is. Yeah, it's beautiful. The sun is really fierce. Oh, look at the mountains today, Jim, when they're all sunlit. 
Isn't that beautiful? It really is. By golly, that's just super. You know, unreal. Dave, I'm reminded of a favorite biblical passage from Psalms. I look unto the hills from whence cometh my help. But of course, we get quite a bit from Houston, too. After a stop to pick up the core samples, they returned to the LEM to close out their final traverse. But first, Scott would make history, canceling a stamp on an interplanetary envelope. I'm very proud to have the opportunity here to play Postman. What could be a better place to cancel the stamp than right here at Hadley Rill? Then a demonstration of a classic experiment. Well, in my left hand, I have a, a feather. In my right hand, a hammer. And I guess one of the reasons uh, we got here today was because of a gentleman named Galileo a long time ago who made a rather significant discovery about falling objects in gravity fields. And we thought that uh, where would be a better place to confirm his uh, findings than on the moon. And uh, so we thought we'd try it here for you. Uh, the feather happens to be appropriately a falcon feather for our falcon. And I'll uh, drop the two of them here, and hopefully they'll hit the ground at the same time. How about that? Well, nice. That proves that Mr. Galileo was correct in his findings. Finally, Scott drove the rover away from the LEM so that its TV camera could pick up a picture of the coming liftoff. As the spaceport rifling would say, we're ready for you to come back again to the homes of men on the cool green hills of Earth. Thank you, Joe. We're ready to. But it's been great. 171 hours and 37 minutes after they had lifted off the planet Earth, Scott and Irwin would lift off its sister planet, accompanied by a musical salute they themselves would provide from a small tape recorder on board. Good lift off. Automatic. Hey, good smooth ride, Ed. Almost sounds like the wind wrestling, doesn't it? Oh, what a view of the rail, huh? Older tracks coming down into it. Rendezvous and docking procedures were flawless, right on the money. But their jobs were not over yet. They would spend two more days in lunar orbit gathering data from the experiments and photography. One more day around the moon than any preceding mission. On August 4th, they prepared to come home. But even on their last orbit of the moon, they had another experiment. They placed in orbit a sub-satellite, the first ever launched by a manned spacecraft. It was designed to circle the moon for a year, measuring variations in lunar gravity, the strength and direction of interplanetary and Earth magnetic fields, and the flow of charged particles in space. Packing stations have acquired the satellite. Oh, very good. Then the burn to bring them back to Earth. But their jobs were far from over. 172,000 miles from Earth, Al Warden left the spacecraft to retrieve the 8,000 feet of film contained in the cassettes of the Experiment Bay cameras. Later, they would turn their X-ray spectrometer toward the newly discovered X-ray pulsars, those mysterious black holes in space. At the same time, in accord with the previous plan, an Earth-based Soviet observatory scanned the same areas visually to help derive a model consistent with both sets of observations. During the trip home, the X-ray spectrometer would observe seven X-ray sources and gather 50 hours of galactic data. Then, on August 7th, they looked into the fireball created by the heat of their re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere at 25,000 miles per hour. 
and there would be a heart-stopping moment as one of the three parachutes collapsed. However, the landing system was designed to use two parachutes. The third parachute was an added safety factor. Today, that margin paid off. The success of Apollo 15 had been spectacular. The scientific results had been almost unbelievable. In the words of one scientist, a five-for-one mission. Yet while we rejoice in our success, we cannot afford to forget